I'm Josh Young, and this is Optics, a crash course in three acts. Act 1. We're going to start our conversation with prisms. Now, first of all, I'm going to preface uh, this crash course um, with, I'm sure you already know this, there are, uh, there's a series of optics lectures uh, that I have on my YouTube channel. It's 25 lectures long. There's another series of topography lectures. I think that there are four lectures on topography and wavefront. This crash course is, of course, not a substitute for them. It's a refresher, the sort of thing that you may want to view before OCAPs or before boards. Okay, PRISM, we're going to be covering Prentice Rule, Bifocals, and Anisometropic Anisophoria Part 1. So this is the way that I think of index of refraction. We have here uh, an, an unfortunate and also incompetent driver uh, who approaches uh, a patch of ice and does uh, what uh, those of us who have driven on ice know exactly not to do, which is to step on the brakes, is presuming this is a time without anti-lock brakes. Let's draw some lines here. The dashed line is the interface, that is the uh, interface between the ice and the dry pavement. The dotted arrow, um, I, you know, I don't know if this lets me show my own arrow, um, but the uh, dotted arrow uh, shows the direction that uh, this vehicle was taking before encountering the ice. In ophthalmology, Unfortunately, uh, we don't describe things relative to the interface. That would be far too simple. Uh, we describe things relative to the normal to the interface. So the normal to the interface is the dotted line. It's the line that's perpendicular to the interface. We are moving here from a medium of high resistance, that's to say dry, dry pavement with the brakes on, to a medium of low resistance um, to, to movement, which is the ice. Uh, with brakes on. Um, the index of refraction of a medium can be thought of as the sort of impedance to movement of light through that medium. So in this case, we're moving from a medium of high index, which is dry pavement, to a medium of low index, uh, which is the ice. Uh, and uh, as we move from high index to low index, the ray of light, or in this case the vehicle, will bend away from the normal. So we were moving uh, perpendicular, uh, and um, uh, you see where the normal is, and we're bending away from the normal. Uh, that is drawn here. And this is the direction uh, that the car, or in this case, the ray of light, will, will go. High index to low index, ray of light bends away from the normal. Uh, this skier is unfortunate but not incompetent because he doesn't have a lot of choices. He is moving from snow, which is a medium of low impedance to movement or a low index of refraction, uh, to gravel, which is a medium of high impedance to movement or high index of refraction. So let's draw our lines once more. So the skier crosses this interface. The interface is once more drawn with a dashed line. The initial direction of movement is drawn with a dotted arrow. Uh, and as we move, from a low index to a high index, we bend towards the normal. And of course, this is the situation that we uh, encounter most uh, in our studies with a ray of light uh, moving from uh, air into a lens, moving from a low index to a high index. At the, uh, as it crosses the interface, the ray of light will bend <clears throat> towards the normal. Uh, let's make this quantitative. So uh, on the left-hand side is air, on the right-hand side is water, or just some other high-index medium. Uh, and uh, the ray of light as it crosses uh, from left to right is bending towards the normal. Of course, you can view this as the inverse. Uh, moving from right to left, it bends away from the normal. It obviously works either way. The relationship between theta 1 and theta 2 is this. The index of refraction of medium 1, the medium on the left, um, let's say it's air, um, in which case the index would be 1.0, um, uh, n1 sine theta sub 1 is equal to n2 sine theta sub 2. Let's say on the right-hand side it is water. Water would have an index of 1.33. Um, so uh, 1 times sine 
uh, theta sub 1 would be equal to 1.33 times theta sub 2. That's called Snell's Law. Let's take a special case of uh, Snell's Law. Let's expand uh, theta 1 all the way out to 90 so that a ray of light emerging from the water would just skim over the interface. Okay. Um, in this case, um, uh, theta sub 2 has a special name. It's the, the critical angle because if theta sub 2 is any larger, light simply won't emerge uh, from the from the interface. You can calculate it. Uh, there's no uh, sine of theta that's going to give you a, a value greater than, than 1. That's what the problem is. Uh, so let's actually calculate this out. So let's say that this is air and water. Uh, N1 sine theta sub 1 is equal to N2 sine theta sub 2. Or in this special case, N1 sine theta uh, sine of 90 is equal to N2 sine theta, where we're talking not uh, any theta sub 2, but the, the critical angle, so theta sub critical. Okay, uh, we will uh, plug in uh, some values here, or, or perhaps not. We'll just show you the, the formula. That's what we're going to do. Um, so theta sub critical is equal to uh, the inverse sign of uh, index 1 over index 2. Now, th this looks like a, a daunting formula, but it's so not. Because if you mix up N2 and N1, you're not going to be able to do the calculation. You can't have an inverse sine of something that's that's greater than 1. So it's going to be uh, the lower index over the higher index is going to give you the, the critical angle. And we are actually going to do a calculation with this formula, just not in this slide. Uh, so we're going to move on now to what I call ichthyoptics. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about fish. Do you do you know what 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 fish this 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 is a very famous fish. This is a coelacanth. It's a lobed fin fish, not a ray fin fish. Uh, look it up. Okay. These are archer fishes, and they're really cool. Uh, what they do is uh, they eject water from their mouths and knock prey uh, that is on uh, overlying vegetation into the water where they can then be eaten. Um, as, as an aside, note that uh, the, the, the fish is relatively underneath the, the prey, not, not, not exactly. So this fish is good at optics. Let's see what it's doing. So let's draw our lines here. The, uh, the interface is the dashed green line. The normal is the dashed red line. The uh, locust uh, on the left there is um, this archer fish's target, uh, the index of water 1.33, air 1.0. The fish wants to achieve this. It wants to uh, hit this um, insect uh, with a jet of water to knock it down. However, the fish does not perceive the locust where it is. So we've drawn here a ray of light uh, moving from the locust to the interface. And then at the interface, it's going to bend towards the normal, uh, towards the uh, fish. So the fish is going to, to, to perceive it uh, at this uh, angle that is bent towards the normal. So where does the, the, the fish perceive it? Well, let's project uh, it, it, it's this bent ray of light, a light out into space. So the fish is going to see the locust above where it actually is. And if it shoots water where it sees the locust, it's of course going to miss it and will starve and will be a very unfortunate fish. So what does uh, Mr. Fishy have to calculate? Um, he wants to eject water at theta sub 1. He observes the locust at theta sub 2. So the fish has to calculate this. n1 sine theta sub 1 uh, equals n2 sine theta sub 2 which we know as uh, Snell's Law. Sorry for that little <clears throat> ASMR tea drinking there. Um, okay, so the fish is going to plug away uh, at um, uh, his uh, calculations um, and uh, is going to say, well, fine, let's, let's pretend, let's take this as a case where I see, I being, of course, the fish, uh, I see the locust at an angle of 45. At what angle do I need to actually jet out my water? 
So uh, we're going to plug these values in. We're going to put in the values for N, 1.0 for air, 1.33 for water, sine of 45, right? Because we've extrapolated that out from the angle of the ray of light uh, in water. And uh, the fish uh, quickly makes uh, this calculation, as I know you also would, and uh, does an inverse sine in its uh, little head and says, I need to shoot the water at 70.1 degrees, which is equal to theta sub 1 here. I know this sounds implausible, and that's why I'm going to share with you a little nature documentary. The pitiful beetle is the target of a marksman that stalks the tropics of Asia and Australia. The archer fish, one of the few aquatic predators that can hunt prey outside its element. So of course, to, to minimize its, its calculations, it's going to try to get itself uh, relatively normal to the interface. It just makes the calculation much easier. On average, it grows more than six inches long, but it can hit a target over five feet away, from tiny bugs to small lizards. It forms a tube with its tongue, then squeezes its gill covers to fire. A jet of water shoots out along the roof of its mouth. By positioning itself directly under its prey, it minimizes the effect of refraction of the water. Anyone who has ever tried to spear a fish knows the surface refracts your aim. But not the archer fish's aim. It can even gauge the weight of the target to calculate how much water to fire. A shot typically packs 10 times the force a bug uses to hold on. Alrighty, so uh, let's go on to our, our next ichthyoptic topic, uh, which is this, uh, flying fish. And um, he, here's, here's a question. Um, it's why do flying fish fly? Now, I, you're going to say to escape from, from prey and, and of course, uh, from, from, uh, from predators. Uh, and, and of course, that's true. But why does flying help them to escape from, from predators? Think about it. When they're flying, they're gliding. They're not flapping their, their little fishy wings. So they're actually slowing down in the air. They also can't maneuver. They go straight in, in the air. So as a prey, they're slowing down and they're going straight. Uh, that would, you would think, make them more vulnerable. So why do flying fish fly? And the answer is, at least I believe, is that the flying fish become invisible when they fly. Um, and uh, what, what, what do we mean? The key, I think, is the angle at which the flying fish leave the water, leave that interface. So this is the fish leaving. Let's actually draw that angle out, okay? So that is the trajectory of the fish. This is the interface. This is the normal. This is the angle. I think I measured this out. Yes, yeah, 70 degrees, which um, is uh, greater than the, the critical angle uh, of um, water, which is something like 48 um, degrees. So as the fish exits the interface, uh, the, the uh, fish that are chasing it see it vanish. The fish exit at an angle that induces total internal reflection. Uh, so uh, that, uh, I believe, is uh, in fact uh, why flying fish fly. Okay, so let's talk about uh, prism uh, more generally here. So um, we see as the ray of light uh, moving from 
And, and by, by convention in, in optics now, the rays of light are always going to be moving from the left side to the right side. So let's just take that as a given. As the ray of light moves from air from a low index into, uh, let's say, glass, a higher index, we've already seen that the ray of light bends towards the normal. And then as it exits the prism, it's going to bend away from the normal because it's moving uh, from a higher index to a lower index. So the net is that the ray of light is bending towards the base of the prism. And by convention, we describe prisms uh, by the location of their base, not their apex. We'll see that's unfortunate uh, because a lot of the interesting stuff happens in the direction of the apex. Anyway, prisms have units, and their units are prism diopters. Mind you, they're not diopters. They're prism diopters. That is a completely different unit. Prism diopters is uh, the number of centimeters of drop over one meter. So a prism that induces a, a 10 centimeter deviation over one meter is a 10 prism diopter prism. And we would describe this prism as being a base down prism. Now, there's a ray of light coming in and a ray of light coming out. And what we're interested in is what the deviation is in that ray of light. We're not that interested in the deviation within the prism, just the net change between the uh, ray of light coming in and the ray of light coming out. And uh, we're going to call that the angle of deviation. There is an orientation for a prism that is the angle of minimum deviation. And the minimum deviation is achieved when the ray of light incident to the prism and the ray of light exiting the prism have the same theta. When those two angles are the same, then the deviation is at a minimum. So there are two orientations of prism that we have to learn. One of them is the angle of minimum deviation. And the other one is the Prentice position. A uh, Prentice position has the incoming ray of, of light uh, coming in um, uh, at the perpendicular, at the normal. Uh, to the first surface. Now, why do we care? First of all, the, the angle of deviation with apprentice position is obviously going to be more than it is uh, within orientation of minimum deviation. Because, yet again, unfortunately, in ophthalmology, um, this, this matters because prisms that are made of glass, which you probably won't encounter in clinic, are calibrated in the apprentice position. So the appropriate positioning for a glass prism has its back surface um, uh, in the uh, perpendicular to the line of sight of the eye. So the, the prisms have a little number stamped on, on the side. It may say 10 or 20. That's the number of prism diopters uh, of that prism. In order to uh, achieve the deviation that's in fact calibrated, the prism has to be held properly. So glass prisms apprentice position. Plastic prisms are uh, what you will encounter mostly in clinic. Plastic, prism, plastic prisms are held at the angle of minimum deviation, and that can be achieved by holding the back surface of the prism along the frontal plane. Um, so this is the plane that's sort of perpendicular to the patient's nose, not perpendicular to the line of sight of uh, that eye. Uh, and that will approximate the uh, angle of minimum deviation. <clears throat> now, any other position at which we hold a plastic prism is going to induce a larger deviation. Why does this matter? Because let's say that we want to um, have uh, a 30 prism diopters deviation, and your set is missing the 30 prism diopter prism. But you've got the 10 and the 20. So of course, what do you do? You stack the 10 on the 20, and you hold it up, and you think, this is 30. Well, of course, it's not 30. Uh, the back prism, the prism that's closest to the patient's eye, um, will probably be held properly in the frontal plane. But the prism that you stack on it is not going to be in the frontal plane. It's going to be at some other angle. And in this case, 10 plus 20 equals a number greater than 30, because the prisms are not being held properly. Um, OK. so. Um, we're, you're asked also to learn to be able to convert between prism diopters and angles. And I thought that this was completely useless. It turns out it's only mostly useless. Uh, so let's go over um, what, uh, how, how to do this. 
uh, which is very easy. And then um, later on in uh, this lecture, we're going to find the, I believe, one use uh, for this formula. So for really all kind of reasonable angles, uh, let's say prisms up to almost 60 degrees, um, the angle theta uh, is going to be uh, equal to half of the prism diopters. So prism diopters uh, is equal to uh, theta sub 2. OK, so uh, let's talk about Prentice rule. Um, Prentice rule uh, says that the amount of deviation uh, that's induced by a lens, you can think of a lens as, as you know, uh, sort of a, a continuously curved prism, right? Uh, the amount of deviation that's induced, the amount of prism diopters, is equal to h times d. So it's equal to the dioptric power of the lens times h which is the distance in centimeters from the center of the, of the lens. Now, in optics, as in all of physics, we have to be uh, very consistent with our use of units. And we're always going to be using meters unless we're talking prisms. In prisms, everything seems to be in centimeters. So we're going to stick with uh, centimeters here. We're going to see how our Prentice rule plays out a little bit later on. But let's talk about something first. So fixing head turns with prisms. So uh, this is uh, someone with nystagmus. I mean, not really. It's a stock photo. But it could be someone with nystagmus whose null position is in left gaze. So this person is going to um, uh, be continuously in left, left gaze to decrease his oscillopsia. Uh, but in doing so, he's going to wind up turning his, his head. So we want to be able to correct this. So this is someone who is looking in left gaze and um, because it decreases his oscillopsia. Uh, but in real life, he's not going to be doing that. He's going to be doing something like this, where uh, he has a right head turn so that he can keep his eyes in left gaze and look straight ahead relative to his body, obviously not to his head, uh, to decrease his oscillopsia. So uh, let's, uh, let's start drawing lines, as, as we do. Uh, and I'm interested in how many degrees his head is turned um, so that we can, can correct it. And in this case, I'm saying that his head is turned uh, 20 degrees. And I want to put prisms in front of his eyes uh, to get the rays of light um, to align with the direction of his nose. So with the right eye, we the ray of light is bent towards his nose, and we want it to be, excuse me, is bent uh, to the left, and we want it um, uh, more uh, going straight out uh, from his head. What should the orientation of the prism be? Well, for that eye, it's going to be a prism that is going to be base out, uh, because the rays of light bend towards the base, as we saw. And in the opposite eye, it's going to be a prism base in. So base out in one eye, base in, in, in the other. This is not um, a, a uh, these are not prisms that are correcting for strabismus. These are prisms that are correcting for head turn as a result of a null point. And this is the one circumstance in which I can see any utility to converting between diopters and degrees. Uh, because we need a prism that will induce uh, 20 degrees of deviation we know that uh, the prismatic power is equal to twice the uh, angular power, approximately. So these are going to be 40 diopter prisms, uh, meaning uh, 40 base out in the right eye uh, and uh, 40 base in in the left eye. And uh, that will correct uh, this gentleman's head tilt. He'll still be able to gaze to the left, but he'll be able to look straight ahead doing it, and this will straighten his head out. OK, so let's put Prentice rule to uh, use. And we're going to build up to something uh, that we're going to call uh, anisometropic um, uh, an anisophoria. Uh, OK, so um, this is a ray of light that is passing through the center of the lens. Uh, any ray of light that's passing through the uh, uh, center of, of, of this lens, through the null point of the lens, is going to emerge from the lens undeviated. Well, what about a ray of light that is one centimeter north of the optical center of the lens? So h here is equal to one centimeter. The dioptric power induced will be five prism diopters. Now, here's the question. Is it five prism diopters base up, or is it base down? 
So the ray of light is being bent down, therefore this must be a base down prism. And you can think, and I'll be showing more slides like this later on, of this plus lens as being, as if it were, two prisms oriented base to base. Okay, and similarly, if the gentleman is looking uh, three centimeters south of the optical center of the lens, three centimeters times five prism diopters, 15 prism diopters, base, that's right, base up. Okay, so anisometropic anisophoria. This is someone who is minus five in the right eye and minus one in the left, and he doesn't tolerate his, his spectacles. Now, what's the most common reason for him not to tolerate his spectacles? It's nothing to do with, with prism. It's because of anisoconia, but we're not gonna deal with that now. Let's deal with, with prism. So this is someone who complains of vertical diplopia um, looking 1.5 centimeters down from the optical center of the lens. So let's do this, this calculation here. And uh, we're gonna look down 1.5 centimeters and 1.5 times five in the right eye 7.5 and in the left eye 1.5. Um, and uh, these are base down prisms. Um, uh, because uh, minus lenses are as if they were two prisms oriented apex to apex. Once more, we're, 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 we're going to do a second round through all of this, this stuff, and I'll show you um, an, an easy way to think of what the orientation of the prisms is. But suffice it to say that we've got this calculation down. 7.5 in the right eye, 1.5 in the left eye. Because the orientation is the same in both eyes, what we're interested in look, is looking at the difference between the two. So the difference between 7.5 base down and 1.5 base down is equal to 6 base down. Uh, so you can describe this, the net prism, the net change, as being 6 prism diopters base down in the right eye. For those of you who are keening for extra credit, yes, it, you could also describe it as 6 prism diopters base up in the left eye. But let's stick with the 6 prism diopters base down in the right. Prisms can be added. And this is definitely an absolutely OCAPS and board topic because you would never in real life do this. If you had a prism, a, a, a patient who required five prism diopters base down uh, in one eye and five prism diopters base in in one eye, you would simply write that on the prescription, five prism diopters base down, five prism diopters base in. But yes, you could combine the two. Uh, and you combine them geometrically uh, to uh, seven prism diopters. This is just vector math, right? Of, uh, the square root of five squared plus five squared is just about seven. Uh, base down and in uh, with a, at an angle of 45. Do this for the boards, don't do this in real life. So we're gonna do a little bit of uh, geometrical math here. Um, we're gonna take a prism on the left that is of some prism diopter power and we're gonna subtract from, from it this square uh, or, or cube. Um, the, the, the square has got parallel sides. There, there's not gonna be any net deviation to the ray of light. Yes, there'll be a deviation within the block of glass, but the net deviation will, will be zero. So mathematically, this is some number minus zero, which is equal to the same number. So the shape on the right has the same prismatic power as the original prism on the left. If we continue taking these chunks out, then we're going to have something that's very light and very thin, um, and this is what we call a Fresnel prism. And the little ridges that you see on the Fresnel prism are the apices of uh, each of these little uh, tiny prism triangles. Kind of cool. Okay, um, another uh, interest of ours with Prentice Rule uh, deals with prescribing bifocals. Um, and there are two characteristics to bifocals that we need to uh, engage ourselves with, and it's image jump and image displacement. So uh, let us talk about that. So we, we, we have a, a uh, uh, soccer ball uh, there, or if anyone from outside of Etazuni is viewing this, uh, yes, we, we know that you people call that a football. Uh, and what step is it on? So it's the fourth step from the bottom, right? Let's count them. One, two, three, four is our soccer ball. Okay, so uh, this is uh, where things are in real life. This is patient with bifocal number one, and you see there's a, a discontinuity in one of the steps. The steps is wide and then it's narrow, and that's, you know, un unpleasant. But let's count what step the um, 
the soccer ball is on. One, two, three, four. It's still on the fourth step. So this is an example of image jump, um, which is annoying. This is an example of image displacement. In the example I'm showing you here, there's not much image jump. There's a little bit. But what step is the soccer ball on? One, two, three, four, five. So image displacement is going to make this patient trip because he's going to see one more step than there actually is. Image jump is annoying. Image displacement is a problem that we need to, to deal with. So uh, whence do these things come? OK, so we're going to take a, um, an ad. Uh, we're we're going to take, in this case, a plus 3 ad. We're just in this example here. I just have a plus 3 lens, uh, the cross-section of the plus 3 lens. Of course, it is convex. And we're going to say that this convexity is as if it were two prisms oriented base to base, as I had alluded to er earlier, but I've drawn out now. Uh, so two prisms oriented uh, base to base. There are a number of bifocal uh, types that we can derive from this prism, I mean from this uh, lens. The first one is we're going to lop off the bottom of the lens, and that's going to create a round top uh, bifocal prism. Now, uh, the image jump is something that is induced um, from the top of the, of the bifocal. Uh, so gonna, let me go back a, a, a couple slides here. Um, the, the image jump is the sudden discontinuity as the patient's eye moves from the distance portion of the lens to the add portion of the, of the uh, lens. So image jump is something that takes place all at once at the top of the bifocal. By Prentice rule here, um, the distance between the top of this bifocal segment and the center of this lens, uh, which when we lop it off is at the bottom of the, of the bifocal segment, that distance, that H, is large. So the amount of prism that is going to be induced uh, by the top of this um, bifocal segment is going to be large. Let's say that this bifocal segment is one centimeter high. That would be three prism diopters. Uh, and I know you all just shouted out base down. There's another sort of a uh, bifocal called a, a flat top. And for whatever reason, the, the flat top is not um, bisected through the optical center of the lens, but just a little bit underneath it. Um, therefore, H in this example is a small number, a non-zero number, but a small number. And uh, so there will be some prism power that's induced, uh, and it's going to be base up prism as opposed to the round top, which I base down prism. Base up prism, it'll be a non-zero value, but it's going to be a small value. There are other types of uh, bifocals. Uh, if you uh, have the opportunity to prescribe a bifocal type yourself, you may prescribe something like a D25 or D28. That's actually a flat top bifocal that is uh, bisected above the um, um, optical center of the lens. But we're not going to worry about that because those sorts of, of bifocals tend not to show up on OCAPs. There's another sort of a bifocal called the executive or Ben Franklin type. It's a bifocal, but it's not really an ad. Um, it is a distance spectacle that is bisected through its optical center and a near spectacle that's bisected through the optical center. And then the, the one is just glued to the, to the others. So the line goes right across uh, from one edge of the frame to the, to the other. It's not a real ad. Uh, it is a, a bifocal because it is bisected at the optical center. Uh, there is uh, no image jump because h is equal to 0. OK, so what sorts of lenses require what sorts of bifocals? A plus lens, this is a hyperopic patient wearing plus 5. Uh, the, the, the distance lens, uh, which is uh, sort of marbleized here, it is, can be thought of as two prisms that are oriented base to base. So the bottom part of the distance lens, that part on which we're going to be applying the add, is uh, a base up prism. The image jump here is going to be large because all round tops have a large image jump. There's a big distance in the ad. There's a big H between the top of the ad and uh, the optical center of the ad. But what we're interested in here is minimizing image displacement. And image displacement is a result 
of the total prism power for the bottom of the lens. So what we want to do is pick a bifocal segment that negates, that counteracts the um, prism that is naturally induced in the bottom of the patient's spectacles. So a hyperopic uh, patient is wearing spectacles that are oriented as if they were base to base. That means that the uh, inferior portion of the spectacles is base up. We want to choose a bifocal segment that is base down to counteract some of the um, some of the uh, uh, base up prism. So round tops go to plus lenses. Flat top lenses might decrease image jump. They certainly will. But they're going to increase image displacement, um, which is a problem. So this is the person who is uh, not going to see a lot of discontinuity, but is going to trip on the stairs. We don't want that. Um, so uh, uh, however, um, we also don't want a round top uh, in a myopic patient for the same reason. Uh, and uh, we do want a flat top um, in a uh, myopic patient. So image jump is something that's dependent entirely on the bifocal type. If it's a round top, it's high image jump. If it's a round top on a myopic lens, a plano lens, a hyperopic lens, it doesn't matter. Large image jump. Um, image jump is just something that the patient's going to have to deal with. Image displacement is uh, what we're going to attempt to minimize. Okay, so let's deal with a special topic now. Uh, and the special topic is prescribing uh, high ads. So let's say that we have a, a, an AMD patient whose uh, BCVA best acuity, let's say, is uh, 2080. Well, if you give a, a plus three ad, uh, the patient's not going to get a, a, a very good near vision. The patient's going to want to hold things closer, and so we're going to prescribe a higher ad. And uh, a, a nice little rule of thumb is to use what's called the Kestenbaum rule. And the Kestenbaum rule uh, estimates the required ad by inverting the acuity at distance. So let's say that we have someone whose acuity is 2100. So 100 over 20 is 5, or plus 5, means that we're going to give this patient a plus 5 ad. That's going to allow this patient to hold the material 20 centimeters from his face without accommodating. And 20 centimeters without accommodating is a problem because a lot of people are not going to be able to converge uh, to get the eyes to, to line up with something that's at 20 centimeters. Remember the near synchesis, the three things that happen when we look at something up close. It's uh, convergence, um, accommodation, and meiosis. Um, those things are, are yoked. And uh, if we're cutting out accommodation here with this high power ad, uh, we're probably not going to be able to get the convergence that we want. So we're going to have to put in prism. Now, if the patient is unable to converge, he's essentially exotropic. I know it's not really exotropia. It's convergence in sufficiency for this, this particular ad. How much prism uh, are we going to put in? Uh, the, the, the rule of thumb here is very easy. You take the ad and you just add two to it, and that's the number of prism diopters. So this is a plus five ad. Uh, so what is the prism power going to be? It's going to be five plus two, which is seven. And it's going to be base. What's the base going to be? The ray of light deviates towards the base. That's true. But another rule of thumb is that you want the apex of the prism to point towards the deviation. So this is someone who is um, effectively deviating out. I know, not really deviating out, but not deviating in enough. So this is going to be apex out or base in prism. Seven base in OD and seven base in OS. So this is how we prescribe. Uh, and of course, for high ad readers, it's always going to be base in prism. Um, this is how we prescribe. Uh, base in for high ad readers, and this is how we estimate what the ad's going to be uh, with the Kestenbaum rule. Here's another special topic. Um, the, uh, most presbyopic patients now are not wearing uh, uh, bifocals uh, with an interface at all. They are wearing uh, progressive lenses. And there are a lot of different types of uh, progressive lenses. 
um, but there are uh, several relatively consistent zones. Uh, there's the distance portion uh, on top. There's the reading portion on the bottom. There's an intermediate portion that's in the middle. And then there are these blend zones on the, on the side. Uh, and um, the blend zones are just simply not clear. So if a patient with progressives looks down into the side, the image is going to be blurry. Um, the uh, blend zone, uh, it, it, the, the width of the blend zone uh, is variable and the, uh, obviously, you know, fancier progressives are going to have wider blend zones. Um, and uh, the amount of real estate dedicated to intermediate as opposed to uh, near is, is variable too. Now, we as ophthalmologists don't prescribe um, the progressive type. That's something that we leave to the optician uh, to, to determine. But this is just uh, a slide showing, just from Zeiss, different sorts of progressive types with different sorts of uh, variables. As ophthalmologists, we prescribe the distance and uh, the total add. Uh, we write progressive and uh, we leave the rest to people smarter than we are about lens design. And this is our intermission.